All right. All right, everyone. Uh, my name is Moise Raja. I work for Cisco. Uh, I've been involved with the Open Daylight project since Hydrogen, and I'm a committer on the controller project. And uh, mostly I work on the clustering pieces, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so before I start off, uh, a word of acknowledgement to the people who have collaborated with me, uh, especially to Tom Pantelis. A lot of work uh, was done in this uh, release, the lithium release by Tom Pantelis, uh, to stabilize uh, uh, the code, basically, and, and uh, improve the performance of uh, the clustering code. So I'd really like to acknowledge his work. But all the others, I mean, they've uh, helped me a lot. My colleagues, Harman Singh, who's over here, and uh, Kamal Ramesh, they've done a lot of work on the uh, raft and uh, data store code. Um, and a lot of good work done by Phil and uh, Radhika and all in setting up the cluster, testing it, and stuff like that. So I, I acknowledge uh, their work. I thank them for that. Um, here's the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to start off with a few architecture slides, and mostly because everybody might not be familiar with the architecture of uh, all our clustering, uh, the clustering implementation that we have, the ACOVS implementation. Um, and then I'll get into a little bit, you know, some, somewhat a, of a dry topic, which is how the code is organized. Um, really, this session is about actually explaining how things work. And the goal is that at the end of this session, some of you might actually feel like you know, contributing to the clustering uh, code in, in uh, ODL, or it might help you when you're building your application to debug issues and things like that. So that's why I'm actually going to go into some of the details. And uh, if it gets uh, too boring, just let me know so that I can skip a little faster. Um, some of it might be interesting. I mean, there's a lot of animations in the slides. Uh, hopefully, that'll keep you interested. <laughs> but uh, if it gets uh, boring, let me know. I'll move a little faster. And I'll, I'll leave more time at the end for questions. So um, I'll start off with the architecture. So essentially, um, we have two subsystems implemented. If you, if you remember the Yang, or if you've been to any Yang session, there are three components to the Yang. One is you have your data. So you have a, like, you know, a schema where basically you specify what kind of data goes into your model. Then you have um, your RPCs, and you have your notifications. And we have implemented two things in the, clustered, uh, in the clustering implementation that we have. Uh, the first one is the data store. And the idea behind the data store implementation, obviously, is uh, you, know, you, you allow for high availability and you allow for scalability, where you have all these various members talking to each other, distributing the data, and somehow that works with the same kind of API that we have for, uh, let's say, the in-memory implementation. And similarly, we have the RPCs. So if you have, an, if, if you have a routed RPC, and you register it on any node, you want to, uh, to invoke that RPC either from restconf or from any, any node in the cluster, regardless of where it's being invoked from. So these are the two subsystems that we do have implemented. The one which we don't have implemented is the notifications. Um, I don't have a clear use case for that. So maybe you know, I can talk with you guys and understand your use cases, and then we can see if we need to prioritize this for beryllium. But right now, I don't, have, uh, I don't have a good use case for remote notifications. So these are the two subsystems that we do have implemented. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on this. Um, actually, uh, how many of you already understand the architecture? Because I can go faster <laughs> if you already understand. Because the interesting thing would be the flows, which will come on later. Uh, but I'll go, into, I'll go into the architecture a little bit so that people are just familiar. All right, the, the next part is, what are these? what is this built on? So both the distributed data store and the RPC connector, they are built on, the foundation is essentially ACA. So everything is built based on ACA actors. And that is our way of actually ensuring that these components can, can uh, reside on any node in the cluster. The actors can run anywhere. And you can invoke these actors or send messages to these actors from any node in the cluster without building in that intelligence of where exactly that actor resides. So that's what we use ACA for. Uh, and there is something common about these two modules. 
These are completely distinct modules. There's something common about it. There's, there are things which are not common, and I'll go into the details of that. The distributed data store, one of the modules which it uses from ACA is the ACA persistence module. Now, uh, sadly, when we, uh, we started using this, this was an experimental module. So it's uh, actually subject to change pretty quickly. And uh, in fact, with the 2.4 version, there is an incompatibility which has been introduced, which we'll have to deal with in beryllium. But uh, right now, this is what we are using. And what ACA persistence gives us is the ability to store, like, you know, the durability is given by ACA persistence. So you can store data, and then when you restart your node, you get back the, your data, and you reconstruct the state of your tree. And uh, ACA persistence has two different things. One is uh, it can deal with the journal, and the journal essentially is all the modifications that you ever made to your data tree is stored in your journal. The other thing is the snapshots, where the whole state of the tree is stored in persistence, basically on your file system. Um, for the journal, we use LevelDB, which is a very fast implementation. We actually use LevelDB JNI. Uh, and because we use LevelDB JNI, on certain uh, operating systems, it might not work out of the box. So um, there is talk of actually using LevelDB Java, but uh, there is less performance. But I won't go into, I think I'm going too much into details. Anyway, <laughs> so the idea is LevelDB is used for the journals. Uh, and uh, we, the snapshots are stored on the file system directly. The next thing is ACA remoting. And as its name suggests, essentially it's a module where uh, it lets uh, one actor system on one node communicate with an actor system on another node. So that's basically the idea. And uh, we, have, we also use ACA clustering. And that we use for discovery of the nodes. So for example, if you have two nodes, and you want to find out where the other node is or what its IP address is, like where it's hosted or whatever, ACA clustering is what gives us that. And uh, ACA clustering also gives us other things like, uh, for example, is the member alive or dead? Uh, or is it reachable or not reachable? Things like that. So these are the common, this is the common base that uh, all these modules are, are built on. No. All right, so um, both are using actor systems. Now one detail in there is both of these are using uh, different actor systems. And um, why this is significant is because each actor system, the actor system is actually a pretty heavy thing. And, and what I mean by that is you have actor system which hosts a uh, actor hierarchy. So you have a hierarchy of actors where one actor could be like a supervisor for a, a bunch of actors and that those actors could be a, a supervisors for other actors and things like that. So that you have a bunch of actors associated with it. That's some configuration associated with an actor system. So that tells you, uh, for example, you know, how your, uh, like which port, remoting port should be open for your actor system, things like that. And finally, you have the dispatches. And actually, this is the heavy part. So this is your thread pool. Now, let's say I, I configure an actor system and I say, I want 16 threads to be used by this actor system. Now, if I have two actor systems, and I'll have 32 threads active at any given point of time. And that's what makes this heavy. And this might actually have been a mistake. We are, we're trying to actually consolidate these actor systems. So right now we have two, but we'll probably have one in the future. So that both of these share uh, the actor systems. The next thing which is common amongst these two uh, implementations is data synchronization. Um, the data store is kind of obvious. You have trees and you, you want the data, like the data tree to be synchronized. So essentially you have a big, like if you, if you know about our Yang system and the way we actually store everything as a tree, we have a big tree of data, right? We have inventory, topology, maybe toaster or my app or you, know, you, you name it, we, we've got that, right? Now we put that, we used to put that in one big tree and we have to synchronize that tree. I mean, if for a high availability. And we have this data synchronization built into our data store. And we use an algorithm called Raft. I mean, you might have, I, mean, I think you might have heard references to that before. Um, 
we use that to, for consensus to make sure that all these trees look the same on each node. So that's basically the idea. Uh, but for RPC, it might be less uh, intuitive as to what exactly uh, are we uh, synchronizing. So we, we synchronize the RPC registry. So on each node, you register. For example, if you have an open flow switch and it's exposing the ad flow RPC on node one, you want to know exactly how to invoke the ad flow on that switch. And that information goes in the registry and the registry is actually replicated too. But it's not replicated using raft. We use a gossip uh, based uh, implementation to distribute information about that registry across the cluster. Uh, the difference between these two is that raft actually Raft has a strong leader, so always your the data distribution is always from the leader to the followers. That's basically how it works. Whereas with Gossip, each node talks to each other and then distributes the data. So Gossip actually works better when you have a very large cluster. Raft works well only with smaller clusters. So up to 20, clusters, uh, 20 nodes in a cluster is okay with Raft, whereas with Gossip, you can go up to 400 nodes. A little bit more detail about uh, the thing, about the distributed data store. So um, what's the main idea behind uh, distributing data? If you have two members and you have a client on one node and you have the data on, a no uh, on another node, like you have member one and member two, client is on member one and the data is on member two and you want, to, you want to just access that data. And how do you make that possible is basically what this implementation is all about. So what we do is we actually put in a proxy object where the client is accessing the data. So that's what we call distributed data store. So that if you go and uh, look at uh, the implementation, you'll find a class called distributed data store, in fact. And if you look at the implementation, that's what guides you as to what is the next step, what, what will happen uh, when you invoke, for example, if you try to create a transaction on distributed data store. So now this distributed data store has to talk to the data, the data tree, which is on member two. And how you make it happen is, well, come one slide uh, later, but essentially distributed data store, I mean, this is like a filler slide, but distributed data store is an implementation of DOM store. It's an SPI. Uh, I think some people are familiar with that because they're trying to build their own data stores. If you want to build your own data store, you have to implement this SPI interface. And distributed data store is one of those uh, implementers. In-memory data store is another implementer. The data tree is, uh, is a consistent data tree. So what that means is once you write the data in and you do a subsequent read, it should be there. Whereas with gossip, it, it's an eventually consistent mechanism. So it may or may not be there, but sometimes you don't care. Like for RPCs, maybe you're willing to tolerate that. For data, we can't. All right. All right, so going back to this, how the distributed data store communicates with the data tree well, actually, I've got this uh, kind of, it's showing up pretty light, but there's a box around this, uh, you know, the data base <laughs> or uh, that symbol. So we put an actor around that data tree, essentially encapsulate the data tree within an actor so that when you want to communicate it with that data tree, you just send messages to the actor and that message is processed by the actor and that modifies the data tree. So that's essentially how this works. So the communication, I mean, we use ACA for communication, essentially. The next thing is the data distribution. So once you are able to access data remotely, the next thing you want to do is you don't want to have all your data in one place, right? So you have this big data tree, inventory, topology, toaster, uh, foobar, I mean, whatever, you put everything into the data tree, and now it's become a big data tree it's become so big that it doesn't even fit into your into one node because I mean there's not enough memory on that node. So what you really want to do is break it up into smaller trees, onto subtrees, and you want to distribute it across the cluster. So this is kind of uh, this also works with this uh, implementation where you can have inventory on member two, you can have topology on member three, and if you actually have a larger cluster, maybe you know inventory is, is on a subset of that cluster, topology is uh, on a subset of that cluster, and things like that. 
So um, this is again about the same thing. The, if you have the big tree, you need to break it up, right? So essentially what we do is at the module level, we break it up. So you had the, like the root level and you had inventory topology and toaster under that. Now what we did is we just took inventory topology and toaster and put it into its own shard. Now we can do that, so we can have module level stuff, but what happens to the rest of the data? What happens to foobar? What happens to my app's data? That has to go somewhere. So for that, we have this default container. And if you go and look at, uh, if you just run the controller and you go and uh, go into JConsole and you look at, uh, I'll show you what to look at. But you'll see there'll be one shard in there and its name will be either default config or default operational. And that shard actually contains the rest of the data. So everything else. Today, there is no way to actually say that store inventory and topology data in one shard, which might uh, be a feature which we might need in the future. Um, but this is what we have for now. All right. So the next thing is um, high availability. So I, I'm, I'm able to distribute my data. I can have inventory on one node, topology on another node. But what, what about, what if I had inventory on one node and that node failed? then would I lose my access to my inventory data? I don't want to lose access to my inventory data. So essentially what I do is I distribute that also across the cluster, I replicate it essentially. And on member one, I have the leader of inventory and member two and member three are two other followers which have the exact same data so that if member one was, was to go down, then one of the other two nodes would take over as leader and um, you'd have high availability that way. And how exactly that works, is governed by the raft algorithm again. And this is essentially what, these are the two um, basic things in, in raft. One is you have the election. So when you start up, when a, when a shard starts up, it's the follower, it, it starts up as a follower. So it does, because it doesn't know about anything else in the system, so it just starts up as a follower. And then it waits for some time. It waits for, you know, about 10 heartbeats, let's say. and if it does not receive any heartbeat from the leader in that time period, then it becomes a candidate. And again, it waits. Well, actually it waits, but it uh, waits after sending a request for a vote. So it says, well, I am on term five. I want a vote from uh, the other people or other replicas. And of course it votes for itself. So. Once it gets, if it gets a vote from, let's say you have a three node cluster and you get a vote from one other node, then you become the leader. Otherwise you stay candidate and maybe you start off another term. If you get a request from the leader, then well, then you give it the vote and you remain a follower, something like that. Um, once you become a leader, then you, you have the authority to replicate data to the other nodes. So you start replicating. So over here, the leader replicates the, like calls, sends these append entries messages. And append entries serves both as a heartbeat as well as a way to replicate data. So it's like a two in one thing. And um, that's how the replication works. Um, the consensus, how it works is, so if you have a leader and you have two followers, you need to be able to replicate to at least one follower and receive confirmation from that follower before you say, well, this is, this is okay data. And then you can commit it, then you can put it into the tree. If you don't get that response, then you cannot actually put it into the tree. So it just stays in your journal. Am I making sense? Question about uh, transitioning from when you lose your leader. Is there a quicker way to uh, force leadership to a different node? Or do you have to no, you just have to kill that node. Yes, that is the only way right now. There are other ways which we are exploring. So there might be a, <laughs> it's coming, uh, it's coming under the guise of two node cluster or something, where what, you, what we will do is, we will say, okay, disable all elections, all the raft elections, so that I can choose the leader externally. But once you take away that from the raft, uh, I mean the raft implementation of elections, then you have to be sure about who you're setting as the leader. But that, that's a topic for discussion, uh, I think on Thursday or Friday. 
under the two node or two node cluster or multi data store clustering implementation. Yeah, so they, I mean, it will fail over, obviously, but it, it'll take 10 seconds for it to fail over. Now, that is a configurable thing. I mean, by default, it'll take 10 seconds. You can make it, uh, you know, re-elect a leader faster, but by default, it's 10 seconds. So application need to be aware. Actually, we do have uh, an exception which gets thrown uh, at the point where, like in that 10 second time period, if you do try to do something, uh, an exception will be thrown, data store unavailable, okay. and then you can handle that. Um, all right, this is going to be an animation which will move pretty quickly, so please watch. <laughs> so th this is just demonstrating that when you have a transaction and it gets replicated, you just need to have one other node get that transaction before you can confirm that, okay, turn green, put this into the data tree. You don't need to have them replicated to both the, both the nodes. In fact, I, I could say you can take away follower two completely and you still would have the transaction committed. However, you will not be able to tolerate follower one, for example, like after follower two is down, if follower one also went down, then you will have no other, no other commits happening. You can have transaction five, transaction six. All those transactions can keep coming in and uh, they'll be put into the journal, but they will never be applied to the tree. That is if leader remains. Of course, if it was followed, the transactions itself will get rejected. If the leader die and on, uh, lies and only follower two has the transaction, then follower two will uh, like actually become the leader. It will become the leader because what happens is with raft, uh, there is this election property where, uh, let's say even if follower, let's say follower one became a candidate before follower two, and it'll request a vote from follower two, and it'll say, okay, I have uh, you know four tra uh, like three transactions, and so my commit index is three, and my term is uh, let's say four. It sends that this guy checks, okay, you have a higher term, so you can become a leader, but your index, your, the number of entries that you have in your journal are less than what I have. So you cannot become the leader. So it will reject the vote. And then it will become a candidate itself. And it will request a vote. So when follower two requests a vote, it will get the vote because it has a, like a longer log. And these are all properties of raft, essentially. All right, so the other thing is, now we have these append entries happening and, and the journal is being replicated one at, entry at a time. But typically when you bring up a node, you don't want uh, you know, one by one the, the entries getting replicated and getting into the log because it takes too much time. So essentially what we have, and this is not, I mean this is a general solution, but I'm explaining it in terms of restarts. So when you restart the node, when follower two comes up, instead of sending it append entries, we just send it the snapshot. So the whole data tree is sent as a snapshot. And uh, what we do in addition is we actually break up, because this data tree can be arbitrarily large, so we break it up into smaller chunks and we replicate it. So we break it up in two megabyte chunks, which is configurable, but essentially that's what we do. And uh, well, the main reason for doing that is because ACA has some limitation in terms of how large the message can be. Finally, we have uh, durability. I mean, I, I explained this earlier that um, the data tree, there is the data tree which is in memory, but there's also the journal which is persisted. And the reason for this is when you, when you restart, you have to recover from persistence. Like for example, if you have configuration data, you've added a bunch of flows into your configuration. When you restart your controller, you want to see all those flows in there because otherwise you won't be able to re reconfigure your, your switches the same way. So the level DB journal is essentially all the, all the modifications that were ever made are stored in the journal one by one. And the snapshots you have because, again, you want to recover faster. Let's say you have uh, a million uh, flows in your journal. You don't want to wait uh, like a long time for each 
like enter each flow to be read from uh, disk and then uh, be put into your data tree in memory. You just want to, uh, like, you know, the, to put all the, the whole data tree into a snapshot, which is a disk file, which will be read all at once, and the tree will be constructed from it. So that's what uh, this durability part is for. It's to help with recovery. So any questions on the architecture, on distributed data store? See, first of, uh, first of all, there is uh, no additional data store that you have. This is like this data store is core, like it's it's runs in the same VM as your controller. Okay. So you don't have to install an additional component. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, in fact, that is one of the uh, yeah the pros of this whole thing exactly. that you don't have to install anything else. You just have to you just all you need to do is run your controller, and you can have a distributed data store package along with it. But if you do have Cassandra, and I'm sure people will, what would be the disadvantage of using Cassandra is every time you, you make a modification to your tree using the md -Sal API, you would have to send that data over to Cassandra. Uh, so essentially, your transaction would have to be committed onto Cassandra. So you'd have to serialize your data. And we, since we have this whole thing under control, we actually do something which makes modifications, like local modifications, much faster. So we avoid that whole serialization for local transactions, and I'll, I'll come to that. So there's a flow in which I'll talk about it. Um, anything else? I have 23 minutes, I need to rush. <laughs> All right, so invoking RPC is about the same thing. You know, Earlier we had member one, member two, we, we were trying to access data. Here we have member one and member two, where consumer is on member one, and the provider is on member two, and this somehow has to work. So again, how this works is, we have a proxy on the consumer end, which uh, understands how to route uh, to a remote broker, which is on the other end. And uh, that is done by actually, I think I'm, I'm skipping something. Uh, remote RPC broker here is actually an actor. Okay, so uh, the remote, uh, the RPC provider can actually send it messages. So whenever it wants to invoke it, it just sends it a message and then the, RP, uh, the remote RPC broker gets that message, it interprets that and it calls the appropriate method on the provider. The RPC registry is populated this way that uh, if you have a provider and you register your routed RPC, when you register the routed RPC, we have an RPC listener in the remote RPC broker which actually gets invoked. So it gets called. That way we know that somebody has actually registered an RPC. So it's, a it's an internal mechanism. Actually, other people can use it too. But anytime somebody uh, registers an RPC, we get notified. And when we get notified, we add that information to this RPC registry, so this bucket, essentially. And um, this bucket is what gets replicated. Now the RPC replication uses this gossip mechanism where any time something changes in this bucket, we actually change the version of that bucket. So for example, let's say uh, as a switch is, is connected to uh, one node in the cluster, like OpenFlow 1, let's say, let's call it OpenFlow 1. That registers, and because it registers, you have to register an RPC for it. Let's say an ad flow RPC has to be registered. When you do that, you register the RPC, we get invoked, RPC listener gets called. That in turn modifies the uh, bucket for that particular node. And once it's uh, modified, we change the version. And once the version is changed, then that is eligible for replication. Because the other nodes would not have a bucket, essentially all the information from that particular node will not have, it will not have that particular information because it has a, like an older version of the data and kind of works like this. 
um, each node has the bucket information for all the other nodes. So member one will, will know, for example, that on member one, uh, I have version one of the bucket, member two, I have version five, member three, I have version seven, and so forth. And this information is replicated to all. This way, when I, when I send the, the bucket over, or basically I, I do a gossip with the other nodes, then I can tell, okay, I have an older version, so I need to request a newer version from uh, the other node, something like that. So the gossip mechanism works like this. Every second, all the members send uh, status messages to each other, and essentially that is telling, okay, I, I know of these versions of the buckets. And then, based on that information, the nodes can actually say, well, send back a status uh, if they have, like, if the version is, uh, is lower, then it sends a status, otherwise it sends an update. Well, I think this is actually too deep. <laughs> I'll have to go, uh, I have to talk much, much more about this if I have to explain this thing. But, um, I'll skip this. What do you say? <laughs> so the idea is this. I mean, if if the bucket information, like we, this is like, uh, you know, just everything, every object is versioned. And if you have a newer version of an object, uh, you, you basically send it over to the other node. If you have uh, an older version, you request it from the other node. It's as simple as that, okay? Yeah. So that's, that's because they keep exchanging the status message every one second. Every second they say, okay, I, I think this is the, these are the version, this is the version information that I have. Yeah, they keep, they keep sending to one arbitrary node. It, they, they don't send it to every node. So member one, for example, right? Member one sends its status message only to member two. And member two sends it to member three. See, it's, it's not like member one is sending both to member two and member three. So any one node. And when they send that message, the other node can say, well, my, my version is, is higher, so here's, here's a new version. If it says, well, if it gets a version which is lower, then it says, okay, send me another, you know, it sends a status again. When it sends a status and the other guy gets a higher version, then, well, it, well, it updates it. So that way you when keep they, exchanging. When they're communicating between themselves, they, they inform of all the versions they know about, not just their own version. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, actually this kind of poses uh, one challenge which we will tackle later, that uh, right now the version is on each bucket. So the whole registry, the registry can actually be pretty large, depending on how many RPCs you're registering. Um, so we will try to fix this late in a later release. I'm going to uh, talk about modules, uh, yeah. Well, uh, you actually, when you uh, register an RPC, you have to give a specific identifier for your RPC. For example, if you, let's say you have multiple uh, switches, right? And all the switches have an add flow that you can invoke. But you need to distinguish them somehow, right? Both of them would not work. The last one will win. The last update will essentially win. So you cannot have, uh, you know, when you call add flow on the same switch, like open flow one switch, let's say. It's not going to call RPCs on two different providers. It's going to call only on one provider, which is the latest that was registered. You, you can, but you, I mean, it wouldn't do you any good. Both of them registering for the same switch is not going to do you any good, for example. Uh, yeah, we will see the bad example. Some other thing. I think you're, what you're talking about would be uh, more useful for, uh, for a, like, you know, publish, subscribe kind of mechanism, yeah. which uh, is the Yang notification mechanism and uh, we do not support remote Yang notifications today. 
we can talk about the use cases where that would be helpful, but uh, we haven't discovered them yet. Yes. Yes, I, there is an API. I'm going to talk about that okay. shortly. Actually, I'd like to rush through this modules thing because I, I really have less time. But this is essentially talking about how the code is laid out. Uh, if you're really, I mean, you can look at the slides and you can determine what they do. So um, the main thing, uh, the main components are SAL clustering common, SAL ACRF, SAL distributed data store, and remote RPC connector. The others are like peripheral to it. Uh, look at that code, look at these slides, and uh, you'll see what, what exactly is in there. Um, that way I can go on to the flows. Is that all right? Okay, so for data store, uh, I'm just going to talk about what actually happens. Like some, uh, some simple flows like startup, shutdown, or transactions, what happens, uh, so that you can actually follow the code. And, I'm, and the class names which I mentioned, these are real class names. You can go ahead and look up on your ID, and you can know that that is your starting point. So for example, like with the data store, right, there are two modules, in fact. The data, there are two data stores. There's a config data store and there's an operational data store. So you will see two modules in there. One will be called distributed config data store provider module, and one will be called distributed operational da data store provider module. So those are your starting points. And when it starts up, there's a create instance method in each module, which gets called. Now, uh, when you call create instance, it creates an instance of the distributed data store. This is where it starts off. So we call distribute, like uh, create this instance, and then we wait till it is ready. So if, you, uh, if you're familiar with the config subsystem, when you, when you have a module and a create instance is called on that, you're supposed to return an auto-closable, and then the config subsystem moves on. It creates other modules, and then it wires it in with other modules, and so on and so forth. But when you have a distributed data store, how do you know that it's ready for use? I think that's, that's a problem to solve. Because with in-memory data store, it's quite clear. You, you create the in-memory data store, it's immediately available for use. You can start creating transactions and so on. But with distributed data store, you cannot tell, because if I, create, if I just start off one instance uh, of the controller, and the other instances are not started, then consensus will not be there as to who is the leader. So it'll start off, it'll be a follower or a candidate, and so, well, there's no leader found. So if, I, if no leader is found, I cannot create a transaction, right? So this is an attempt uh, where what we do is we go ahead and create the distributed data store, and we have this wait till ready latch, which we have. And over there, we wait for 90 seconds to find a leader. And essentially, that's like you start off another node, and that node starts off, the shards are created, the shards go ahead and, and elect a leader. And if that happens within 90 seconds, then we move forward. The latch will be, the countdown will be done on the latch. It will be cleared, it will move forward. Otherwise, it will block for 90 seconds. And well, it won't wait forever. It will be only for 90 seconds. So once we do that, once you create the distributed data store, the distributed data store creates these two classes. One is the actor context, which allows you to actually um, communicate with the actors, the, because distributed data store is not an actor, whereas actor context is. And it also creates another actor called shard manager. This is the parent of all the shards. The shard manager is what creates all the shards. So what shards it creates, is based on a configuration file called modulecharts.conf. And this information is there in the wiki. So in this case, it would be like shard one, shard, well, shard three, shard four. These are the four shards that gets created. Now, for all these shards, we need to find a leader. And if you don't find the leader in a timely manner in 90 seconds, then we will move forward anyways. Uh, but the result is that if transactions were to be created, uh, Without the leader being found, those, all those transactions will fail. There is a retry mechanism, but they will fail. They might fail. <coughs> now, when the shards are created, the first thing they do is they have to recover from disk. And this is only if they are persistent shards. So the config data store, this is, this is going to happen. First, it will read its state from the disk. It will go ahead and construct the tree. 
and once it's constructed the tree, then it'll, it'll basically go ahead and uh, set its behavior. It'll say, I'm a follower now, and I'm ready for communication. So then the process of election and all that happens, and then the leader is chosen. But the first thing that needs to happen is recovery from disk, and which happens either from the snapshot or snapshot plus journal. Now once the, the leader is found, the countdown on the wait till ready latch happens, and we move forward. Now for both config and operational data store, um, this needs to happen. This I, I won't go through because it's just restating the, whatever I just said. <clears throat> now uh, the next flow I want to go through is the creating of a transaction. So once you have everything ready, you have a distributed data store. In fact, even if it's not ready, you have a distributed data store. You can go ahead and create this new transaction on it. Now if you look at these methods, this new read write transaction, all these methods, uh, some of these methods might not be familiar to you because you might be using it from the binding aware broker perspective and that's, some method names are different for the SPI. But you get, if you create a new transaction, what we do is we create an object, uh, an instance of um, transaction proxy. Now transaction proxy, we create a transaction proxy because when you create a new transaction, there is no way for me to tell exactly which data tree you want to affect, right? You just create a new transaction. You never told me I want to do a transaction on inventory or topology or whatever. So you just create a transaction proxy. And it doesn't actually talk to any shards. But later on, on a transaction proxy, you might do an operation. For example, you, you say, I want to write inventory node. Now this is when we actually figure out, okay, you want to, you want to do a transaction on inventory because you tried to write to inventory node. And that's when we actually go ahead and, and seek, we try to find the primary uh, replica of the inventory shard. So once we find that primary, either by looking up uh, in the cache or actually doing a shard manager find primary, I mean these are two cases which uh, maybe I shouldn't get into. But if it is found, then we create, sorry, if it is not found, we create a no-op transaction context. And this is just a dummy transaction context which will fail on commit. If it is found, then we check whether it's a local transaction or it's a remote transaction. Now, uh, I'll, I'll show you what, uh, what it implies, what remote transaction implies, what local transaction implies, but if it's local, then we, uh, if it's not local, then we create a uh, remote transaction context, otherwise we create a local transaction context. And these are names of classes that you can look up to. So what is a local transaction? If you have a client which is located on the same node as the inventory leader, then you have a local transaction. If you have a client which is remote to your inventory leader, you have a remote transaction. So that's basically the distinction between the two. And this actually has uh, repercussion on uh, performance because uh, of the way we actually deal with remote and local transactions. So we, we actually optimize for local transaction and this is kind of how it works. So let's say you've determined that your, your, your shard leader is local. So you've created a local transaction context, right? Now you're going to do some operations on it. So before you do any operations, we, the local transaction context steals a reference from the shard of the data tree. It, so it, basically the data tree is available on the local transaction context as just an object uh, which can be interacted with. So now I don't actually have to send a message over to the shard leader. I have a reference to the data tree, so I can actually modify the data tree uh, locally. And once you do that, then any operation that you do on the transaction context is directly done on the data tree right there. So write, merge, delete, ready, and it's disappearing, but essentially what happens is when you commit it, then the commit is sent over as a message to the remote shard, but since both of them hold the reference to the same object, they can work with it. Um, so that's, that's basically how local transactions work. For remote transactions, Obviously we cannot uh, steal a reference because this, like you have member one and member two, the remote transaction context is on the client uh, and that's remote. So you don't have a reference to the tree, 
So the only optimization that we can do over here is when you make modifications, we collect the modifications locally into a list. So here we did a write, we said, okay, put that into the list, merge, put that into the list, so on and so forth. And you just collect a list of all the modifications that you want to make. You're not sending it over immediately. You're just batching them. And once you go ahead and do a ready, that's when you send all the, the whole batch over to the other side and you go ahead and update the, try to update the tree, but something like that. That makes sense? It's batching, using batching as an optimization. Now, what this tells us is, if you have a local, if you can somehow do a local transaction, it's going to be better for you because you're doing an operation, all the operations are being done on the data tree, so that's going to be the fastest way to actually update your uh, data to a transaction. But if you, if you cannot do that, if you do have to have your data tree remote, then you should try to avoid doing any reads on that data tree because I'm showing ready over there the ready and read is the same thing. Actually, there is a, uh, there's a separate method called ready. What it does is it prepares the transaction for committing. So that's what ready does. But read actually goes and reads from the data tree. Now, if you call read, then it'll actually, the, a message will have to be sent to the remote node. Everything that was done before that has to be sent to the remote node. It has to change uh, a snapshot. And then, only then can the read be satisfied. So reads are going to be really slow if, you, if they are remote. They're not modifying the same object. In fact, well, this actually goes into how exactly our data tree works. So when you create a transaction on a data tree, it doesn't modify the data tree at, at all. So you, you essentially get back a snapshot, a snapshot of that data tree. And you, you can do any modification you want to that snapshot. And only when you're satisfied with all your modifications, you can go ahead and commit it, which then updates the final tree. Um, or you can just throw it away and nothing changes. So when I say, when you do a ready and it, everything goes over to the other end, what we are really doing is we send this message, the batch to the other end, we create a snapshot and we make the modifications on that and prepare it for commit. Two minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, Let me, I have just two minutes left. So I'm actually going to skip over to all this stuff and talk about diagnostics. I think I probably need a much larger session for this, a longer session. <laughs> because you'll need to diagnose the issues, right? So <laughs> I think I'll need to start with that. So when you do transactions, I'm, I'm skipping all this stuff, but if you have questions later on, we can talk about this after the session. I, I think I, I prepared too many slides. Uh, so this is about tracing a transaction. If you have a transaction you, and you want to figure out what's actually happening with the transaction, monitor the log messages. Because we actually put in some information in each log message which tells you what exactly uh, is happening with your transaction. For example, on the client side, when you create a transaction, you'll see a log message in the, on the client log. So on, let's say, member one was the client. You'll see a, a message which says, create a transaction member two, transaction some number of type, whatever is the type of the transaction. And this is what it actually means, that this transaction was created on member two. That is the initiator of the transaction. The counter of the transaction, this is the 94th 9400 tran transaction that was created, and it's a read-write transaction. So that's what it, it means. Then uh, once you try to do an operation, again, the same thing is printed now. We also print exactly what, uh, which type of uh, data that, that you're actually trying to read, for example, in this case. Then on the server side, you'll see something like this. Member three, shard inventory operational creating tra uh, transaction shard member two. So here what, it's, what we are saying is, the leader, this is inventory, uh, inventory is the module, inventory operational, and member three is where the leader is. 
because otherwise this transaction creation request wouldn't have ended up over here. The, uh, like create transaction always goes to the leader. That's why it's ended up over here. Then you have the data store type. Well, sorry, the arrow is pointing to the right, <laughs> wrong location. Uh, it's operational, really. Uh, so once this is done, on the other side, when you, when you try to commit the transaction, you'll see something like that. Transaction member two, readying one transaction for commit. On the server side, you'll see readying transaction member two, transaction 900. Then transaction member to commit on the client side, committing transaction on the server side, commit succeeded, and that would be the end of the transaction. Uh, similarly, you can trace replication. So this is when append entries are happening. So from the leader, you'll see something like this, sending append entries to follower. On the follower, you'll see something like this, uh, like the append entry arrived, and it's been handled, and the leader got back the append entry. So you can trace your, any, uh, any uh, replication issue, you can go ahead and trace this way. Now the other diagnostic uh, capabilities we have is um, the beans that we have. So uh, this you can monitor using JConsole if you want to. But uh, I put down, put down the name over there in the same convention that you would use for, for example, if you're, if you're constructing a Jolokia URL. So essentially this, this is for the distributed operational data store bean, where what you're actually monitoring is the inventory operational shard here, the member one in inventory operational shard. So, and this is what you will see on member one. On member two, it will be member two inventory operational shard, and so on and so forth. And there's a ton of information that you can get from here, uh, including things like, you know, what is the current commit index, which was the last uh, index which was applied to the log, uh, who is the leader, um, what is the RAF state of that particular replica, and so on and so forth. Um, you should try launching uh, one instance of the controller and going to JConsole and checking it out. There's a lot of information there. Similarly, for shard manager, you can tell what are the local shards, whether the uh, current uh, data store is in sync with the other data, like the replicas, and so on and so forth. Um, then there is some runtime information which tells you what is the current um, transaction creation rate limit. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to go through the rate limit, rate limiting behavior, but we actually rate limit, like limit the number of transactions that you can create. Uh, it's just a back pressure mechanism so that uh, you, like any client, uh, no client can overwhelm the data store. Uh, we also have operation limiting. That, that means uh, you cannot do more operations um, than what the data store can handle um, before applying it to the state. Um, but that is not, there's no way to monitor that. And then we have uh, a bean which actually tells you the details of the commit rate. So how many, like how quickly are transactions being committed? What is the 50th, how many have been committed? What is the 50th percentile, 75th percentile, so on and so forth. Um, did I repeat something? And then we have a bunch of beans which uh, give statistics about each and every message, each and every account message that actually occurs in the data store. And this is something which is common with the RPC as well. So uh, I think you, somebody had a question about uh, can we access, uh, what kind of information can I query about remote RPCs, about the RPC registry? So if you go to the remote RPC broker, it has a couple of operations, like this find RPC by name or RPC by route. So you can go ahead and query as to whether that particular RPC has been registered or not, as it's there in the registry or not. And uh, finally, the same message statistics are also there. There are beans for each and every message statistic. Now any questions? dynamically adding and removing nodes is not there. So we haven't implemented uh, certain portions of raft which uh, allow you to add and remove, like basically join and leave, right? We haven't implemented that. Something that we're targeting for uh, beryllium. 
Other questions? Rest configuration for configuring what? Uh, no, right now the only way to configure it is using a configuration file. There's a module shards conf. That's how you specify, for example, which shards you have. Uh, RPC does not require any additional configuration. But uh, the rest of the stuff, um, well actually, the data store configuration itself, we do have a, like a CFG file which contains all the configuration that you could possibly do. Uh, we don't allow you to change it uh, using REST or anything, but you can actually view it using JConsole. That was one, that's basically what one of the beans actually does. It shows you the configuration. There's another question? Yeah. For now, it's static configuration, yes. Yeah. So what happens with my site? If it has a console based device or then config based device, how do you do like clustering to avoid you know, one connection, one node gets failure, and how do you protect that connection? So that's right now, we actually don't ha have open flow clustering. We don't support something like that. For that, we would have to have some API which could actually give us the leader for a given switch so that you can gain mastership, because that's how OpenFlow 1.3 works, right? If you have the same switch connected to multiple instances of the controller, one of the instances has to take over as master. And that can only happen if there was some election mechanism amongst uh, the various instances, which we don't have today. I mean, the data store has it, but it's not exposed as a service. Yes. So we have, uh, we've been running DS benchmark against uh, three node clusters. I have various numbers. Uh, so we, we're about, to, we're doing about uh, 30,000 to 100,000 transactions per second based on the DS benchmark numbers in a three node cluster with replication. If there's a conflict, yeah, you would. No. Well, what uh, what would you do if you had a larger cluster? That's a, that's a question. I mean, what use case do you have today? I mean, You want to support a lot of devices, like IoT kind of thing. So you want to support large scale. Well, we need to build in more primitives before you can even make that happen. Because even if you had all those devices connected, where would you put the data? Uh, is that going to go into like one uh, big module, all the data goes into one module? Because updating that one module obviously will have limitation. You have one actor which essentially gets all the updates for that, so it's all queued up because that's how the actors work. You ha for each actor, there's a, there's a queue, and every update will get processed in sequence, one by one. So that is not going to scale. We'll have to come up with some way to micro shard it, you know, like break up that shard into smaller shards so that you can update the data. Uh, but once you have micro shards, then you have, you know, uh, like you have to be able to aggregate the data in case somebody does a query. So all those other problems have to be solved before we can even reach there. So for beryllium and actually maybe even for lithium SR, one of the SRs, we first want to solve um, solvable problems like open flow clustering, net conf clustering, things like that, so specific applications. And then maybe open it up to like general solutions, like IoT kind of things. I think you should experiment with IoT with single node for now, for best performance. <laughs> More questions? Pardon? Yeah, 
they'll be available. I mean, I'll, I'd be happy to go through them with you. I think I underestimated uh, the amount of time. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll of course upload them to uh, the Open Daylight Wiki. More? No, I actually haven't even uh, started with transaction chaining. Oh, okay. That would be a whole different, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'll need a whole session for that. Uh, but uh, when I say ready, you see that's what re ready is an uh, internal, it's an SPI uh, method. Uh, when you're using, when you're building an application with a binding aware broker, mm -hmm. you actually never use, you never know about ready. Because what you're essentially doing is you're creating a transaction and then you're doing a put or a merge on it, and then you're submitting the transaction. So that, those are the methods, right? What this, so ready, yeah, so yeah. Is submit, is ready. Submit, yeah, Once, as soon as you do submit, we do a ready. But then it goes to like pre-commit, commit. That's something which happens on the back end. Okay. Some, some things which we need to actually streamline more. But um, do, you, do you provide any hooks for, uh, for pushing the data outside of like if you want to use our own data? Yeah, you can do it actually. Um, so ACA persistence itself is, uh, is pluggable. So by default, we are, we are using level DB and, and the file system is where we store the snapshots. But you could actually store it somewhere else. However, remember that uh, we still would use raft for replication. Is the next session about to start or something? Okay. All right, I, I'll have to take it offline. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>